Hey everyone, and welcome back to another deep dive video. This week we're looking at Roman numerals. Um, Eric's ill, so if you uh, see him sneezing and coughing throughout the video, uh, then send him your love and and uh, hugs rather than your frustration. Uh, but we'll try and edit out all of the all of the coughing as much as we can. Um, so this week we're looking at Roman numerals. It's the most complex exercise we've looked at so far. It's not a hugely difficult exercise but it is a bit more uh, in depth. There's a few more ways to solve it. You have to think a bit more uh, just to come up with a, a naive implementation. So we're gonna be taking a bit of a tour through how different people have approached it in some different languages. We've got uh, some recursive solutions. We've got some table-based lookups. We've got something that uses the different base of numbers to do clever stuff. Eric's gonna to have to talk us through that one later. Um, but we're gonna start off as we like to do with what can only be described as the cheaty way uh, to solve this exercise. And just to mention, if you haven't solved it yet, the idea is that you get uh, a number and you have to transform that number, that Arabic number, the numbering system that we use today, you have to transform that number into its Roman numeral equivalent. And presuming you know what Roman numerals are, um, if you don't, well, maybe go and solve the exercise to work it out. Uh, but yeah, let's firstly start off with a bit of a cheating example with this. Um, and that example uh, I've got here and is from Common Lisp. Uh, Eric, there's not, there's not a whole lot to talk us through here. But uh, yeah, do you want to start us off and just explain what, I guess, what line nine is doing? Yeah, so... Um... Well, we're not in the Middle Ages anymore, so uh, writing things in Roman numerals isn't as common as it used to be, but there are still use cases. So a couple of languages have support for it built in, and one of them is Common Lisp. I've also found PLSQL has it, and a couple of others too, but not that many. But uh, the cleanest version that I found was the Common Lisp one, where you basically you have a format string, and you're saying um, tilde at R, and R is uppercase Roman numeral, and then you get a uh, automatic conversion of your uh, Arabic number to a Roman numeral. So built into common list, you don't need to install anything. It's all there for you. Nice. Very impressive. Um, it's the second week in a row that common list has impressed me with what it can do with its strings. Um, so yeah, definitely feels like a bit of a cheaty solution, but uh, you will see, you know, get full points for it. So if you want to cheat with that, I, who am I to criticize? Um, but let's move on to the first sort of real solution now. Um, I hadn't seen this one before. I always take a look at what Eric sent through just before we start recording. I haven't really seen this approach before, but I, I, I really love it. Um, this is uh, Sanders' version in, in C Sharp. Eric, do you want to tell us what's going on? Yeah, so this is a, a quite a nice approach, I feel. So the idea is that um, you have a number and you repeat uh, I, which is one in Roman numerals, um, n times, so the, the value of the number times. Uh, so you would get 30 i's if the number is 30, but obviously that is not correct, and then not, not a correct Roman numeral. But then you just uh, string replace all uh, sequences of five i's with a v, so then you get v's. Uh, then you do the same with four i's, and you do iv, etc., etc., etc. So you handle all the special cases, and um, then at the end, you get a valid Roman numeral. Um, this is um, not very efficient because every single uh, replace call will return a new string. Uh, if the number is very large, you start out with, for example, if the number is 2,000, you get 2,000 i's, which is quite, quite a lot of uh, i's, even though the end result will be just mm, so just two uh, characters. But still, it's, it's easy to understand, and I like the idea of starting out with like the, the the simple solution and then getting all the edge cases out of the way. Uh, the ordering is very important here. So um, you can start with four and then do five because obviously for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But um, if you get the ordering right, then this is probably easy enough to uh, to implement and to understand. Yeah, I'm sort of amazed and surprised it works, um, <clears throat> especially when you see like the VIV to IX and... Obviously it does, but I think if I was starting this out myself and thinking, should I give this a go? I wouldn't be convinced that this was a solution that that would actually work. Um, I don't know if that's stupid of me to think that, but uh, yeah, I'm impressed to see this. I like it. I think it's a it's a you know terribly inefficient solution, as you say, but you sort of think it's quite an elegant solution at the same time. Yeah, and um, you can also see like that Eric. 
Oh yeah, I, I actually quite like it. I, you can also see sort of the rules here. You can see that you can't have five of of a single numeral. That there is always another human yeah. that you then use. So five i's is a v, five x's are an l, and you can see that if you have four of a kind, then that will result in two numerals. So um, you you can sort of see all the the exceptions here, and um, you can also see that there are three numerals where if you duplicate them, you get another numeral. Uh, so v v is x and l l c. So all the rules are basically there. So um, mm -hmm. I, I, I sort of really like this actually. Uh, yeah, it's but a, not looking at the efficiency. <laughs> yeah, putting away any sort of software engineering approach, but just looking at elegance of code, I quite I quite like it. Um, okay, so moving on now to to Crystal, uh, Mike's solution in, in Crystal, um, and this is the first one where uh, we've got a. Uh, I don't know what the correct crystal language is for it, a, a hash or a map or a dictionary or whatever. Um, but yeah, this is like a pattern that we then start to see in, in, in other ones down the line. Um, but yeah, talk us through this one, Eric. Yeah, this is one of the classic algorithms to implement Roman numerals. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you basically start with the largest numeral, which is M, so uh, which is uh, represents a thousand. And then you, you try to uh, see if the number that you have... Uh, has at least a thousand in it, and then you uh, then you add one m to the end result, and you uh, you subtract uh, one thousand, and you you keep on doing that until the number is less than uh, a thousand, and then you move on to the next one. Then you are, for example, if it's nine hundred, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, until you reach the end. So the idea is that you go um, from the largest numeral. And you keep on going until it doesn't uh, match anymore. So if the remainder is less than that numeral's value, and then you move on to the next one. So and you can see that here in, in line 22, there's an each, and that each has um, an, a number and the literal. So the literal is the Roman numeral, and the num is the, the value of the numeral. And then you have the while loop, which is what I just said. So you keep on going until the, the number is uh, less than the numeral's value. And well, while it is still bigger, you add one of the numeral to the end result. So this is a very classic algorithm. Um, one thing to really note here is that um, a lot of languages, uh, a lot of people have used this, so uh, dictionaries and maps, but not all languages um, have dictionaries or maps. Um, they have a, a random order almost. It won't be actually random, but you can't be guaranteed that the order is as you define them. So in some languages, even though you would define it here, if you would loop over it, you're not guaranteed that the thousand M uh, pair will be the first one. So uh, if you try to implement this in your language, it's always good to check whether or not uh, iteration over a your dictionary or map type is uh, is ordered or not. And, and in many cases, it isn't. So uh, what people then usually do is they, instead of using an object or a map or, or a dictionary, they use an array because arrays have of course, uh, ordering in them. One of the things that still jumps out at me for this, and I guess we see this in a few more, is still the fact that we're sort of specifying like numbers like four with IV in the map itself, which feels a little bit like cheating. And I know in the future we'll come to some that don't do that. But although I like I like this solution for that, I still feel like having that in there does, it feels to me a little bit like, not not honoring the true sort of way of thinking about Roman numerals, if that makes sense, Eric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Let's move on to another one that uses still uses that, um, which is Glenn's solution in in Orc. Um, this is really interesting. It's like it's really readable, um, and it's nice how it sort of combines that that map and the um, uh, sort of spreads that out. So the code and those pairs of values um, are sort of nicely aligned. But it's, at a first glance, it feels much more complicated with the whiles than the ifs. Talk us through what's happening here, Eric. Yeah, so it's sort of like the same thing. So we saw the, the while loops previously. So you keep on iterating while the remainder of the number is still greater than or equal to the numerals value. But um, there is a, a bit of stuff here that you can see that was, wasn't in the crystal version because you can see that um, of all those conditions, there are just four while loops. The other ones are all ifs. Mm -hmm. 
And that is because you can only have one of certain uh, numerals. So the numeral D, for example, is worth uh, 500. So it represents the number 500. But you can't have two Ds because then you would have an M, which is 1,000. And the same holds for uh, the L, which is 50. Two Ls would be C because it's 100. Uh, you have V. So you can see here that um, all those ifs are basically numerals that only occur once. And then where there is a while, you can have multiple of that numerable, uh, numeral. So uh, I sort of like that you have uh, exposed here a bit of the rules about the Roman numerals, that you can have multiple Ms, but you can't have multiple Ds. And uh, other than that, it's still the same uh, logic that we had previously in the crystal version, just uh, top to that, top to bottom, um, largest to, to smallest uh, numeral. Nice. Um, yeah, I like that. It's elegant, Glenn. Um, I'm sure Glenn will watch this. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's a nice little bit of insight of how things how things work. It's also re really well formatted code, so it, it it's pleasant to see. Yeah, and I think it's another thing that a, a lot of what makes these solutions nice isn't necessarily the cleverness of the algorithm or the performance it is just how readable the code is like there's something really joyful about looking at this code and, and seeing it um so yeah um yeah good work good work glenn um moving on another one that's also really readable um and this is in gleam now uh and i guess now we're um we're moving away from looping and into recursion eric yeah, yeah, it was basically a different way of looping. So it's not an uh, imperative way of looping, but it's the functional way of looping, which is recursion. So um, you'll immediately see the logic that we had with the previous uh, awk version, where you go, again, you go uh, top to bottom. So this is pattern matching on the number. And then you have these little guard clauses where it says, uh, if the number is greater or equal than 1,000, then the result is the numeral M. Uh, and then append to that the result of the numerals of uh, the number minus a thousand. So this will just iterate and iterate over all the, the digits until the number is uh, zero, which uh, you get at the end at line 16. So that will just be an empty string. Uh, but uh, in this process, you will iteratively uh, append, well, <laughs> functionally append all these uh, individual numerals into a string. So it's doing the same thing that the org version did. It only does this in a, in a functional way with recursion. It's nice. Um, we were sort of debating between putting this Gleam solution and there's also an Elixir solution we considered as well, which has, rather than having a case statement, just has um, guard clauses on the actual functions. Um, but yeah, there's lots of nice functional ways to approach this. And it definitely, I feel like this is a really good example to to showcase the value of, of recursion as well. I like this one. It still has these, these cheaty pairs of things in for me, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I like it. Um, and then we were looking again, Eric sent me these, and this next one that you're seeing in Python, Eric sent me and I was like, is this, is this not just the same as the, the previous one, but it feels a bit uglier because things are split over multiple lines and stuff. But Eric, you explained to me that this is actually quite a different approach. Yeah, so it, it superficially looks quite a lot like it, but if you squint, you can see that the numerals that are mentioned, you don't get that uh, that IV and that CM, so those exceptional cases. And that's because this solution uses a different type of logic. So let's look at line two. It says if the number is greater or equal to 900 and less than 1,000, or it's greater or equal to 400 and less than 500, then we need to output the, the either the CM or the C, uh, what was it, D? Um, I, I, yeah, CD. But um, the way that this uh, algorithm does it is it outputs the C, and then for the second bit, it basically says, hey, uh, we're going to recurse, but we're going to add 100. So suppose that it was, the number was 900. So that's what match, we would output C, and then we would continue recursing with 900 plus 100, which is 1,000. And then when we get back, we will match the clause where you output M, so for 1,000. So you will still get CM, but this is actually not doing um, 
the number is not uh, decreasing all the time. It can actually increase for these uh, exceptional cases. So uh, I just mentioned the example of CM and the same, of course, holds for IV4. Uh, that's on line six and seven. But um, with this approach, you get the special, case, special casing handled uh, first in the, the, the first three um, if, sta if clauses, and then you get the normal uh, processing of the numerals later on. Uh, so I, I sort of like that this makes it more apparent what the special handling is. And you can also see that there are uh, for those uh, C and those X uh, special cases, there are two variants. So one is a uh, number uh, between 900 and uh, 999 and 400 and 499. So you can see that there are two different ways in which you can prefix a number with the C, two ways in which you can prefix with an X. So um, I, quite, uh, I quite like this solution. Uh, because it it feels when you're doing a recursion, usually, well, you want to terminate. So you're usually just saying, hey, you have to uh, get smaller all the time. But it, that isn't necessarily the case, but it's usually what you do. But in this case, you, you temporarily uh, increase the number. So you add to it uh, only to then have it be finished because it, it no longer gets in these uh, exceptional cases. Yeah, that's a really good explanation. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, it feels... Really unusual to see recursion that has a mixture of adding and subtracting. And I'm, I was trying to cast my mind back and think, have I ever seen this in another place before? So I think it's... Uh, well, Collateral Conjecture has it, so... Yeah, true. But uh, yeah, but kudos uh, to uh, yeah, Dan Danilo for coming up with this, because I think it's not an intuitive way of thinking about it. You have to sort of break out of some mental boxes to be able to uh, do this, so... Yeah, I like it. I like that we've got rid of these pairs now and uh, mm -hmm. it feels a bit more of a pure, a pure solution, I guess. Um, so then moving on to something a bit different, I guess those last few you can really pair together. Um, next up, we've got uh, Brian's solution, um, Cheerful Stoic in uh, Elixir. I don't know what's going on here at first glance, Eric. Talk us through it. Okay, there, there's more than one thing going on here. So um, obviously we have recursion here. So um, if you look at line 11, you can see that um, uh, there is a, a pattern function being called, and then there's a recursive function numerals. So um, let's just see what that pattern function is that is at the bottom. So um, pattern has four parameters, uh, number, middle, modifier, next. And uh, if you look at those conditions, you can see, hey, there's a couple of things that it, uh, it looks at. If the number is uh, less than or equal to three, then it repeats the number for uh, the, the amount of uh, the, the value of the number. So this is basically the rule that you can have. Uh, if you have one, two, or three, uh, you have uh, I, 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 I. Uh, same with uh, the M's. So... Um, if you have a number and it, it can repeat at most three times. That's a rule in Roman numerals. So you, this is a rule. Then if you have something that repeats four times, you get the fact that you uh, you can't just output four of the number. You have to output the like the, the next uh, value, the, the, the next greater numerals value. So let's take I as an example, which is one. So if we want to uh, output four ones, we, instead, we have to output one five, which is V. So that's um, middle. Uh, but then we need to prepend it with the I so that we get IV. So the modifier is I here, and the middle is V. Mm -hmm. And we can see in a short while, while that's, uh, how that works. And then um, for um, less than or equal to eight, which means that it's, it's either... Uh, five, six, or seven. So again, we have three. So this would be, if we have six, we would have a uh, V and we have one I. So you can see here that um, the middle, and that again, that's the, that V that we had previously, and it's concatenated with um, num the number minus five value. So if you would have six, that will be one. Uh, so you you get one i, so you have v and one i, which is six. For seven, of course, you get v and you get two i's. And then uh, finally, the the last 
uh, variant in this function is that the number is nine, which means that it is, again, you have to have the, that modifier thing, but now you get the next uh, parameter, which would be, uh, if we were still looking at the, the i version, that would be x, which is 10, and then you put the modifier, which is i, in front of it. So, um, and the, 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 the key thing that this uh, solution realized is that this single function can apply in all four cases. So the case when the, the number is less than uh, 10, the case when the number is less than 100, the case when the number is less than 1,000, and it says here when the number is less than 10,000, but it could have been less than uh, 4,000 because the maximum Roman numeral uh, in default uh, notation that we regularly use is 3,999, but uh, that's also less than 10,000, so it's fine. But uh, so you can see here that uh, in the, the first numerals uh, version, which is line six, it's calling pattern with uh, the number value. Uh, the middle value is V, the uh, modifier value is I, and the next value is X. So that if you apply that to what I just explained about the pattern function, it all works. But the fun thing comes when we look at the next numerals one, which is when the integer is great, uh, less than 100, but it must be uh, greater or equal than 10. So what you then do is you call pattern with uh, the number divided by 10, which is div pos integer 10. So um, if you would have 60, that would result in the digit six. And then you would have L, X, and C as the, the middle modifier in X. So if you have 60, um, so that would be six, you would get in the, the, the third uh, part of the condition, which is a hey, middle. Now the middle one that we uh, supply is L and then you multiply, so we do one of the modifier. So we get L X and that is indeed 60. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just, um, yes. we basically look at the, the digit for the tens, the digit for the, Mm -hmm. uh, the hundreds in the next bit and the digits for the thousands. And then once we have, uh, once we have outputted that digit, we just continue the recursion bit by calling numerals, but then removing the, uh, the actual, uh, value that we just processed. So, uh, if it was, mm -hmm. uh, 63, we will remove the multiples of 10. So that will be 60 and we will be left with three, and then we continue numerals and we get in the case where the number is less than 10. So this is doing recursion again, nice. but uh, it's doing it in a way where it uh, recognizes that the the different parts and the different uh, uh, values uh, all can use the same output logic. So I like that this mm -hmm. has all the output logic in just a single place. So this like, this feels complex at a first glance, that pattern function. I, I feel like, not to critique code, because that's not why we're here, but I feel like I would, and I'm, I think I'm gonna do this when we when we finish recording this, it, like if we shifted around the order of the parameters in pattern a little bit and maybe rename them to like one, five and 10, I feel like rather mm -hmm. than trying to remember what modifier next mm -hmm. and middle are, I feel like that whole, that pattern function would just be more yeah. intuitive. Yeah, and I think the whole structure is really nice. I feel like this is how my brain thinks about Roman numerals. Like when I'm actually trying to solve some Roman numerals, this is what my brain effectively is doing. It's like looking to see, it's forgetting that we're a thousand, and it's just saying, mm -hmm. okay, well, these are the three yeah. letters that I deal with in these area, in this area. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I I like this for that. Um, for that, are you a fan of it, Eric? Um, I do agree with the naming. So um, I think mm -hmm. probably a, a naming could be improved slightly. Um, mm -hmm. But well, as an engineer, uh, we probably all like the fact that we have our core logic in one place. So uh, mm -hmm. even though it might not be, be immediately apparent what uh, what the rules are, because number less than or equal to eight, yeah, well, what, what does that say? But um, maybe with some variable naming, we could do a lot here. But but I, I sort of feel like this has uh, at least improved the fact that the logic is in one place and the rest mm -hmm. could just uh, use that, that single, single function. So that's one thing that I really like. And 
you can also see the symmetry here again, which I greatly appreciate here. Mm -hmm. um, and other than that, it's, it's a nice recursion. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's yeah, it's, nice. it's cool. I might, um, yeah, I might throw up a, uh, a Ruby version that I do later on the screen now, magic, um, uh, to, yeah, to show off what I'm saying a bit about the variable naming, because I reckon we could get this really, really clear with a bit of, bit of refactoring. Um, so the next one, Eric, is um, MIPS assembly. If you're watching this, breathe, it's okay. Um, we'll get through it. Um, and again, this immediately, well, you know, for most mere mortals, we look at this and we're like, I've got no idea what's going on. But you were saying to me before, this is basically what we've just seen in Elixir, but yeah. just in a language that feels a lot less familiar. Uh, yeah, yeah, because that that is what it is. So if we, um, it's using macros, so that's uh, it's like a uh, like a template that you can apply. Uh, we can see what it does later on, but the the key thing is in uh, the macro that starts in line eight, which is called digit. Uh, then you have a value, you have one, but you also have percent to value four, and we previously we saw that there was also something about four being special case. So that's the um, the next, like the five value minus one. You have the value of five. Um, you have also have five and your value nine and 10. So um, there is uh, the exact same rules are actually applied here. It's just that you need more logic here. So, um, so you can see on line nine is branch if less, less than. So uh, if the value of nine is less than, uh, uh, what's in uh, L5, then you you branch, uh, you branch to L5 if the value is less than nine, because uh, then you do the next one, you do the next one, you have to, so you have separate um, branches. I, I, I don't probably need to go into every single line here, but the idea is that you get the same uh, single place encoding of the values, and you reuse that for the, the digits, the tens, the hundreds, and the thousands. So if you scroll down a bit, you can actually see that. So um, if you see line 40, 44, 45, and 46, then you see the same patterns that we saw in Elixir where you have uh, a thousand, you have an M, 4,000, 5,000, A, 9,000, we can't even get to, it's B, but uh, it's just there for, because it has to have the, the, the last parameter, I think. Um, and then you have 100, you have C, 400, 500, D, 900, M. So if you would scroll back a bit in the video and you would check what is there in the Elixir version, you'll find that these are the actual combinations you'll also find in the Elixir version. Um, or that you might argue that this ordering is actually slightly better because it starts with the smallest mm -hmm. value, then it has the five value, and then it has the 10 value, which I don't think the Elixir version did. So... Um, yeah. I, I sort of like that uh, progressive value a bit better, but this shows that even though MIPS is quite low level, it isn't actually that much code. So uh, if you, um, mm -hmm. so a lot of it is actually there's already five lines is just storing a byte uh, in the output, uh, which has another macro too. But um, maybe if I can, um, maybe we can look at it one last time. Is the line nine? So that's the, the nine value. So if it is the nine value, you have to output the one value and then the 10 value. So for, I don't know, 10, you get I and you get X. So I is the one value, X is the 10 value. And that's what you see in line 10 and 11. Output the one value, output the 10 value, and then uh, subtract the nine value. And then uh, you just, you continue. Uh, so, it's the same logic. It's not that bad, actually. So don't be intimidated by MIPS assembly just because you haven't seen it. Because the once you get used to this, it's actually not that bad. Nice. So yeah, I imagine for most of us, myself included, it would take a bit of time just to really sort of get comfortable with, with everything we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. probably worth spending just 10 minutes. You can always pause the video and just read the code or you can... Um, follow the link later and have a have a look on Xism, but actually just taking a bit of time to look through this because I think, yeah, it it's it is straightforward enough that it demystifies assembly a little bit if you're not used to assembly. Mm -hmm. um, but you still feel when you finish reading this like, 
you've you've done a bit of a mental workout to uh, to work your way through it and, and understand it. Yeah, um, but as you say, Eric, like only like uh, eight or nine uh, different instructions here, so it's not that you need yeah. to uh, read the entirety of the MIPS uh, uh, instruction set, even though that isn't too big actually. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So maybe challenge yourself. Can you um, can you solve this one in MIPS assembly? Um, it feels it feels possible, um, but uh, yeah, cool. Okay, um, let's move on from this, and we're going to now look at totally different way of approaching this, um, and we're going to look at uh, sort of a few solutions that do some things in in this sort of this type of area. Um, but Eric, explain what what I mean by this type of area. This is C plus plus. Yeah, this is uh, this is by the way adapted from another C++ solution, which uh, is actually in the code. So I have a link to it there. But this is basically a lookup table, and it recognizes the fact that um, for thousands you can either have zero thousands, you can have one thousand, you can have two thousand, or you can have three thousands. And in um, those cases, you can just use the uh, the index in the array. So the thousands is an array. And if you get the, the zeroth element in the array, you get the empty string. If you get the first element, you get the M. So if you look at line 12, you can see here, thousands is number divided by thousand. So that is the number of times that thousand, the number can be divided by thousand. So 3000, it will be three. And you would get the third, uh, the fourth element, the element at index three uh, of the thousands array. And that means you get MMM, which is precisely what you need. And then for hundreds, uh, the same logic applies, only now you have 10 possible values. So you have zero hundreds, one, two, up until nine. So the, the first hundred is C, and the ninth hundred is CM. So you get the exceptional cases here too. And then for the um, actual calling, uh, the indexing into that uh, lookup table, you do hundreds and you do the remainder of a thousand because you would have already processed that. And then you divide that by 100. So if you would have 3,300, um, the remainder of division by 1,000 would be 300. So 300 divided by 100 is 3. So you get the element at index 4, in this case, which would be CCC. And that's indeed 300. And then the same logic applies to tens and to uh, digits or units, what they're called here. So the logic is actually quite simple. and. Um, I think it maps very well to how you do uh, arithmetic uh, and it's just, yeah, it's sort of easy to see the, the pattern here. And that's what I, uh, I quite like about this. Yeah, for sure. It's, um, it's a totally different approach, isn't it? But I imagine it's a lot, lot more efficient. Um, there's a lot less processing you're going to have to do. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's... Uh, it's a nice, a nice solution. Again, it feels, um, I guess it feels, I don't want to say cheaty, but it, it feels like, it's a loud pop as my bottle just pops. Sorry if you get that on the audio. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't feel cheaty, um, it, but it feels like uh, a less authentic way than anyone who's actually calculating this themselves would do. But from a software engineering perspective, it's probably a, a better solution, Eric. Yeah, and if you look at it like from a standpoint where you where you break up a number into its thousands, one hundreds, which sometimes you do with arithmetic mm -hmm. just to, to break things up a bit, then it actually it maps quite well. So um, mm -hmm. I, I don't mind this, um, and I think it will be quite fast indeed because you don't the only thing that you're really doing is some arithmetic and appending of strings. So it will probably mm -hmm. be quite fast, but yeah, I thought it was a nice solution. Yeah. Yeah, it's very readable, again, which I like a lot. Yeah. Um, so moving then on to Julia, um, I guess this is, there's a comment here saying smallest lookup table. I guess in some ways it's a similar concept with indexing into an array, um, but there's there's more stuff going on here. Talk us through it, Eric. Yeah, so, so one thing that I liked about this solution too is that it verifies that the number must be from, uh, one uh, up until 3,999. Anything outside that value would be uh, invalid for uh, our purposes. So you can't have a zero, you can't have 4,000. 
Um, although there are extensions to Roman numerals that allow for these things, but that's not part of the exercise. So I sort of like that. And then um, mm -hmm. the, the, the the tricky thing is line 24. So um, you get uh, at the end, it says digits number, which you can probably um, mm -hmm. easily understand for if you have the number uh, 763, you get the digits 7, 6, and 3. Uh, enumerate uh, gives you the the index and the number. So uh, mm -hmm. the only thing that uh, I found uh, that is in Julia is that you get the numerals digits of the, the digits of the number in the other way around. So you, if you have seven, six, three, you get three, six, seven. So uh, it has to be reversed. So that was quite uh, unexpected to me. And that's why there was the iterators mm -hmm. dot reverse. There's probably a very good reason for that, that mm -hmm. it just didn't grasp but uh mm -hmm. just think of that that last bit is just a regular for loop but um basically doing it from left to right uh, from the digits so seven six three and then uh, the mm -hmm. seven would have index zero the uh, six would have index one and the zero would have index two so um then in the you can sort of see the similar patterns of course because the solutions are also similar mm -hmm. So uh, one of the cases is if the digit is less than four, then you get uh, the the full number. Um, I don't know about the naming, but the full number is uh, basically a thing that can repeat. So um, as you might have, uh, I've mentioned before, some digits can't repeat. So V, L, and D will never repeat. So you can see that here in these two um, in these two lookup tables where you have. Uh, the, the full bit that is repeatable, but the half bits aren't. Uh, and then, right. so it is indexing into that digit. So um, if the, for example, we get the number uh, a thousand, the digit, the digit will be one. Uh, so uh, you do the, the, I don't even know what you call it, the head, uh, head thingy, the head operator, that's exponentiation. So, um, it basically see, means multiplying by uh, itself. So you're basically saying, hey, uh, give me digit, uh, uh, digit times the same thing. So if the digit would be three, and it would be, uh, if you index into the Roman numerals full, it will be i, you get three i's. So that's basically what it's doing. So we had the string, I think we had string dot repeat somewhere in, uh, was it the Elixir, I think? Um, mm -hmm. But you can also see that, for example, if the digit is four, um, so suppose again that this is uh, the actual number four, so um, the index would be zero because that's the index into that uh, in that array. So uh, the numbers full with index zero is i, and the Roman numbers half at the same index is v. So you get i v, which is precisely what we want for four, and. Um, Star is what many other languages use plus four, so that's a string concatenation. Uh, and there's a, a I, I looked this up. There's a very good reason for this because mathematically speaking, the plus is um, commutative, which means that the order doesn't matter. So two plus three is same as three plus two, but that as, that doesn't hold for string uh, concatenation. So um, a b plus c d is not the same as c d plus a b. That's why they did. Uh, the use the multiplication symbol here because it's uh, it's not the same as uh, addition with a plus, which is commutative, whereas uh, multiplication isn't commutative. So that's a, a, a little side note, but uh, I found that interesting because <laughs> you you very rarely see string concatenation not be done with a plus. Um, mm. So if you just look at the the indexing things, um, so for the digit nine, you can see here. Um, so suppose it is actually nine. So the index will be zero. Uh, so you get the, the i in the Roman numerals full, but then you get the Roman numerals full index plus one. So you can see that's the x. So you, then you get i x, which is again, correct. So it has the same logic as uh, the previous solutions. It's just that it's encoding it a, a bit differently. So um, it's encoding it the way that if you, um, if you move up to the, the next numeral, you're moving, from one from the full table to the half table, but if you're moving like two numerals, so from one to ten, then you're moving uh, sideways in the the full array. 
So it's a different mm-hmm. way of doing it, but it's um, it has the exact same logic basically. But it's just uh, a very concise way of uh, of defining it. Yeah, that feels like a, a more complicated way with the sort of two tables. I agree, maybe full and half are sort of. I understand why they're called that, but it feels a bit confusing um, naming wise. But uh, yeah, it's I, I'm not such a huge fan of this one, but I might my, my just my unfamiliarity with with Julia. Um, but uh, but it's also like nice that you've not again got these like fake pairs of things mm-hmm. um yeah. you know you only specify each of the letters once and then indexing in feels like again a, a sort of more natural way um to do it but yeah it feels less less readable to me than the the last sort of couple we've seen what do you I think agree. One, uh, what, what i do yeah. think that this gets right is to um to separate the i x c and m <coughs> sorry from the V, L, and D, so that they are, mm-hmm. you can see that they are treated differently. And um, mm-hmm. not all of the solutions have that. So I, I like about this, I, I'm not entirely sure about indeed the naming, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's still, uh, and it's, it's of course, it's uh, it's an easy lookup. So it's it's very small and mm-hmm. it's, it's probably yeah. very fast though, so. Yes. Um, cool, okay. Uh, let's move on. Uh, and we're back to NIM. We looked at uh, a NIM solution last time from Raindrops, which did some pre-calculation of stuff. This looks very similar to that to me, Eric. Yeah, we we would basically like, could we just do that again? Um, I looked yeah. into the existing community solution. I couldn't find one that actually did this. Um, maybe I, I didn't search well, but uh, the idea is the same that we did previously where... Um, Roman numerals are well defined in this exercise from the number one up until 3,999. Um, but those will always have the same value. The Roman numeral for 100 will always be C. So we don't need to do, uh, we, ha- we don't need to calculate this at runtime. We can just do this as compile time because it's static data, basically. Uh, we could, of course, um, make it into a huge array and define it ourselves, but that will be, um, somewhat annoying to either write or generate or maintain. Uh, we can also just use the similar algorithm to what we had previously and then um, algorithmically uh, create that array at compile time. And then when we uh, execute this at runtime, we can just index into that array. So um, at line two, we have a value that's uh, const max numerable. That's the maximum value. And we need that for the uh, the size of the array in a second. Um, then the next bit we can probably skip over is again it's like the this pairing of the numerable with its value, and then within the two numerable function we have a while loop and um, we dec- decrease the number with the value of the uh, the numeral up until uh, zero, and then uh, the interesting thing comes in line sixteen where you have a function that's called gen numerables numerals. And it returns an array of size max numeral numeral plus one. Of course, we need the plus one because array indexing starts at one. Um, we could have just um, make it start at zero, but I, I found just having a direct index uh, and just skipping the, over the first element was nice. So we're saying this is an array of strings. Uh, it will be four thousand strings, and then for the except for the first one, we will pre-generate all those numerals. So uh, the array will have i and one, et cetera, et cetera. And then on line 20, we return that. And you have to scroll all the way back up to see that that is assigned to a constant value, numerals and constants are executed at compile time. So that's the key part. And then on line 22, we have our actual function uh, that we needed to implement, which is uh, Roman, which gets a number. And to get the string version, we just index into the numerals constant compile time generated array uh, with the index being the number. And that's all there is to it. So this uh, trades off runtime complexity with compile time complexity. And of course, uh, you do have an array of uh, almost uh, 4,000 strings. So uh, memory wise, there is also a trade off. 
Um, one question I do have about this. So Roman numerals are famous for not having a concept of zero in them. Um, but obviously, you can index the uh, the zeroth value of this array. What do you get if you do that? Is that um, is that set to a default value in NIM? Is it, uh, will it just I, blow up? What, what will you I get? I think it you, is zero? assigned a default value of zero, but I'm not entirely sure. But um, So there would be an empty string right. in this case, but um, yeah. I haven't tested that, sorry. I might run, run your code in a bit and see what it comes up with. But in actual production code, we but, should uh, probably yeah, add cool. an assertion here. So we have to assert that the number is yeah. in the in the right range. So that would be even nicer. Uh -huh. but I just didn't do that because the tests are well-defined and uh, just keep it simple. Yeah. But you are correct. Nice. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, cool. I like this one. Um, if you haven't seen the raindrops video, we talked about this in a bit more depth in the raindrops one where this was the sort of first place that we had looked at this solution. And there's been a, quite a few comments actually on the YouTube video and the forum and things as well around that solution. So yeah, interesting to see what people think of this one. Um, so on to the, the final one. Um, Eric said beforehand that he wasn't particularly um, looking forward to trying to explain this one. So I recommend everyone just takes a breather, Eric, you too, and reset our minds um, for, for this quite complex explanation of, of how this final solution works. Eric. Right. So here we go. Um, I found <laughs> this in a, in a blog post, which I, uh, I linked to in the solution. And uh, this solution uses a very um, interesting fact in that Roman numerals, numerals can be written as um, mixed radius numbers, so alternating between five and two. So what does that even mean? So um, if you have a base five, the number can be zero, one, two, three, or four. And if you base two, it can be either zero or one. So that's binary. Um, and maybe if you think about this a little bit, you're already seeing that this, this could map to numerals because we have a couple of numbers, so the V, the L, and the D, that can only be either, they can be there once, or they are absent, which means that we can use the, the radix two there. For the other numbers, they can at most actually be uh, uh, listed three times. Uh, so why do we need base five? Well, there is a bit of um, logic there, and we'll get to that in a bit. So let's try and see if we can explain this by looking at an example. So we have the number 753. So you could write that as one in the base of two, two in the base of five, one in the base of two, zero in the base of five, zero in the base of two, and three in the base of five. And then on the line below, if we map that to the numerals, so we can see it's one D, it's two Cs, it's one L, it's zero X's, zero V's, and three I's, which maps to D, C, C, L, I, I, I. And that is indeed 753. And if you look closely at that number, you can see the base was 25225. Two, five, two, so that is what this solution means by uh, using a, a, a mixed radius, which alternates between five and two. And then just looking at- stop you there. Yeah, sorry. Before before we dig into the code, can we just take a moment to appreciate how cool this is? Because yeah. Uh, yeah, that that that's really cool. Um, that's that's quite feels quite magical to see that. I like that a lot. Um, cool. Well, I'll let you dig into the code, but I just wanted to stop there and just sort of take that in a second before we then work out how we actually do that. Because the creation of it's probably just going to be less exciting i suspect in some ways than the actual <laughs> magic of that in itself yeah but, uh, i'm happy to stop yeah. here but now we'll, we'll continue no no you carry on please <laughs> okay I'll, I'll, I'll slide through so um what you will really like is that the letters here there is no special casing here so you can just see m d c l x v y uh, i so you just see the numbers so um we're going to use that um what we're, we're defining five variables so um you don't need to necessarily understand them all. Result is just the, the built up string. Index is where we're currently at, at the letter index. So if we look back at the letters, we're starting left with M. So that will be, of course, uh, incremented as, uh, once we uh, get to processing the other numerals. Radix is two, and we'll get to that later on. 
But let's just start looking at the while loop. So we're going to continue while the number is greater than zero. And that's what we did in all the other solutions too. Uh, so just continue until we've had everything. And then um, this while loop is actually quite the same as what we had previously. So we're basically saying while the the, cur the value is a thousand at, at first, while the number is greater or equal to the current value, then we're just going to add the, the corresponding letter uh, to the result string. So that will be M in this case. And then we're going to uh, subtract a thousand. Uh, so this is actually the same that we saw previously. Uh, the fun bit comes after we've uh, uh, exhausted all the, the multiples of that uh, numeral. So we then check to see if the radix is equal to two. And uh, if so, uh, we calculate something that's called a subtract value. So the value is uh, of the subtract value is value divided by 10. So in the case of a thousand, subtract value will be a hundred. And you can, uh, if you remember the, the, the numerals, you get a thousand, five hundred and a hundred. So keep in mind, that's, that's very important. Um, then it goes to check if num plus subtract value is greater or equal to value. So, um, we got here and that's, Think of we're still at the very first index. We looked at all the thousands. Uh, suppose that the number is 900. Um, the subtract value is 100. And it says that if the number plus the subtract value is greater or equal to the, the current value, that means we have our um, uh, our, our nine K. So uh, it's the, the I X is the CM. In this case, 900 will be CM. So uh, in this case, we uh, we index into the, the letters index plus one and the radius equals equals uh, two. So it's a fun way of basically saying, hey, um, uh, add to the output the uh, the right uh, subtract value. So that will be the, the, the C bit. Then we're going to add the subtract value. So this is the remnant one Python solution where the, the value was incremented, that's actually also in this algorithm. So um, uh, so we if we had 100, uh, 900, we would add 100, which is the subtract value. So then in the next loop, we would still uh, be at the, at the thousands again. Mm -hmm. So this is using the same logic that, that was used in, the, in that Python solution. Uh, and then in the other case, so that was the all the the shenanigans about the uh, subtraction rule. So the, the IX and the CMs. In, in the normal case where uh, we don't have that, that nine clause, we increment the index because we're moving on to the next letter. Then we divide by the radix. So um, think of the, the radix was two. So the, the value used to be a thousand. If we divide by two, we get 500 which is not coincidentally the value of D, which is the next numeral. Then mm -hmm. uh, in line 33, this is tricky bit, uh, bit operations. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, a bitwise soar with uh, seven. And that means that two will flip to five, a five will flip to two. So you can just try this out for yourself. It's basically, you could also encode this differently, but this is highly optimal, of course, doing bitwise operations. So it's flipping the radix from two to five and from five to two. So then if you, um, then we would have 500, we would do the whole same thing again. Um, the radix will be five, so we wouldn't have the subtract value differently. And that is important because for 500, the subtract value would still be a hundred. So if the number is 400, you get uh, uh, C, D, because the subtract value is still C. So um, you only need to update that subtract value when you get to radix is two again, which will be the next loop. Then you do, uh, well, the radix is five at this point. So if we do value divided by radix, you get from 500 to 100. And you can see that this goes on and on. So uh, 100, the radix is two, then you go to 50, radix is five, you go to 10. Radix is five, you go uh, two, you go to five. Radix is five, you go to one. So it's basically doing that uh, 1,000, 500, 100, 50, 10, 5, 1. That's what the radix is doing. And then it's using that same trick that uh, was used in the Python uh, solution to uh, uh, to add the subtract value, which is basically the, 
the value that of the of the digit that you can put before another digit. So it's the C before the CM, uh, and you keep on looping until you're done. So um, it uses a lot of the things that are in the other implementations, but it's using them in a in a quite sophisticated way. I feel I don't think this is actually very readable. Um, there's a famous implementation that do, is doing something like this uh, in the in the tech, so LaTeX in the in the tech source code, and I think it's actually um, the comment there says for someone who likes a puzzle, look at try and figure out what this code does. Uh, so that's nice. Donald Knuth, uh, I think. So I think he had some fun writing that code. It's not the the easiest code to parse, but it's doing uh, a very similar thing to what's being done here. Nice. I hope that makes Thank sense. Thank you for taking it. <laughs> um, I think this is one of those where it's worth sitting down, yeah. going and having a look at Eric's solution here, copying and pasting this into your text editor and uh, yeah, having a play with it and, uh, and, and messing around with it until it sort of all clicks in your head. What I like about this exercise, Eric, and I think we said this when we've been trying to choose exercises in general for 48 and 24 is um, choosing exercises where the, the sort of the naive solution is quite comfortable, but where there's really interesting directions that you can take it. And I think this is a really nice example of something that's just a bit wild, a bit different, a bit yeah. weird, but uh, works really well. And, you know, you'll let, definitely learn something about this. And the more patterns you see, the more random things like this you learn, although it might feel totally detached to the real world of programming, actually all these techniques do become become useful over time and um, there are always places where you think oh yeah that's a bit like that and it, it surprises you that you're using some knowledge you picked up from from something random um so then that's the last of the solutions eric unless i've yep. i've missed any um so i hope everyone you enjoyed watching this eric do you remember what the three featured languages are for 48 and 24 for this um uh, uh, no I, have, I can look them up we can I'll race you to see if you can find the uh, Elixir, Pharaoh, and Julia. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing for this. So Elixir, you've got a couple of good ways. We've shown you one there, Brian's, but you can also try the Gleam one in that. Uh, look at some other functional approaches. You've seen some Julia stuff uh, with the sort of slightly unusual string concatenation. And then Faro, um, always fun. We saw Faro last time in, in Raindrops, this example there, but maybe taking a more object-oriented approach to, to this somehow would be an interesting, uh, interesting thing to do as well. Um, cool. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching that. Um, please let us know what your favorite solution out of these ones were. If you've got a solution that you've done that you're proud of as well, you can link to it in the comments if YouTube lets you link. Um, you can always just put your, your handle and the track in the comments as well, and people can go to, to X's and take a look at that. But yeah, thank you for watching. Please uh, leave a comment, give this a like if you've enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the, in the next video. Thanks, Eric. Uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.